Here we go. So, uh, yeah, just, uh, sorry, getting loaded up there. Um, welcome back, everyone. We've got uh, Mertazar talking about Mako uh, and, and really the Mako binary format, understanding how it works, uh, what the different components of it are, and, and how that's relevant to attackers and defenders. So, I'll hand it over to you. Go ahead, Mertazar. Cool. Thanks. Thanks for the intro. Um, so, hey, my name is uh, Mertazar Manayam. Um, I'm an engineer on the mobile security team at Square. And uh, I'm here to talk about the, the Mako binary format and mm -hmm. kind of what happens when you release an app to the App Store. Um, and, uh, um, so quick overview, Mako binary format is the main executable file format used on Mac uh, OS and iOS. Uh, it's used to store any compiled code you'd see if you're reversing an iPhone app. So it's pretty important to know how to maneuver it and navigate through it. Um, most people that actually look at apps for uh, a company or if you're just doing it um, for fun, uh, you're probably gonna look at apps through the App Store. Uh, in, in some cases, you might be given like an enterprise signed app or uh, an app that is uh, like private. Um, and so in these cases, it wouldn't come from the App Store and you wouldn't have some of the um, uh, technical problems that you would have when, download, when looking at apps from the App Store, mainly the encryption. Um, but in 90% of the cases, you will be dealing with things through the App Store. And so uh, I'm gonna go a little bit on the details of what exactly happens when you submit things to the App Store and how the actual code looks different. Um, and this is pretty important, um, uh, kind of from two standpoints, from attacker standpoint and defender standpoint, but I'll, I'll get into that later. Um, and so uh, as, as stated before, like, why do you want to do this? Um, it's good to know how to navigate the Maco. Um, it's just good to have fluency. Um, kind of, I, I wouldn't say like a like a dis to elf, but it, it, I mean, it, 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 elf is a file format maybe more people are familiar with. Um, but uh, Maco has an enormous amount of information. It's very descriptive, and there's a lot of things that um, you can glean from the binary that can help in reversing. And so um, it's. It's very good. It, it's, it's important to be able to understand all the different nuances of it. Um, and uh, again, I, I keep talking about this point um, just because I, I kind of do defense for my, for, my, for my day job. So it's kind of applicable to that. But um, knowing about the Mako format and how it interacts with the App Store is actually kind of useful to um, develop like program verification of your app. So if you're trying to develop some way to um, like ensure app integrity. Um, it might be a little bit counter to what may, may, maybe most people are talking about here, but um, uh, defenders in the room will definitely appreciate the information I present here. Um, and um, last point, um, if you're actually ring stuff from the App Store, um, you probably should have a good understanding of fair play and uh, how app decryption works and how you can do it. Um, I won't be going into the actual like nitty gritties of like the key exchanges and like how fair play works, but I'll just go over a little bit about what it is and then actually how to decrypt apps. Um, there's a bunch of different tooling to do that, but I'll just show you like a very simple way that makes sense. Um, so quickly the Maco binary format is like has the core basics are um, it's, it's um, like programmed through load commands. And so load commands are kind of um, the structure that rep helps represent different aspects of the binary. And each one of these like commands um, describe how the binary is loaded in memory, um, but also way more than that, it describes like metadata and um, it's, it's very, very useful stuff. Um, and so here's just a quick breakdown of a, um, of a Mako binary. Um, I just, I'll put it the uh, mappings that are used to actually map the code and data into memory. I haven't showed the rest of them, but we can actually go through that in a, um, uh, later on. Uh, so basically there's a, a concept of segments and sections. So segments are what are defined by the load commands and um, they are what the actual kernel uses to take the piece of segment data and load it into memory. Um, and the sections are um, 
what we can what, what, what we can see. Um, the kernel uses information from the Mako to actually jump into the segment. Um, and so you can kind of like look at the permissions on the segments. So like text is read execute, um, data read write, link to edit is a section that might be a little bit interesting, not exactly intuitive, but it's, it's readable only. Um, and they have all different purposes of uh, text. Um, makes sense to have executable, ex executable code. Uh, could be hooked and patched by exploiters and reversers. Uh, data um, has, uh, you can see it has a lot of like objective C sections. And so um, a, a lot of like for, at least for iOS, uh, well, now there's like Swift, but objective C is like one of the languages used to develop iOS apps. And so the data section actually has like the metadata associated with the objective C data. And so, um, uh, I'm not totally sure actually why they're in the data section, but I can only uh, think that it's due to swizzling. So in iOS, swizzling is like a first first class method to hook your own functions, and it's like totally supported by the Objective C runtime. And so I'm guessing they're in the data, so the runtime can modify the pointers easily, um, but otherwise it doesn't really make too much sense. Um, and um, yeah, so I can I can go quickly if, if anyone's interested in um, the uh, symbol resolution. So um, uh, I just want to point out that uh, you guys can like ask questions uh, in the YouTube uh, uh, stream, and then I can try to answer them if I'm going too fast for anything. Uh, if you have any questions, um, please uh, feel free to uh, ask them there. Um, but um, I can, I'll just go quickly over symbol resolution, just real, real quick. Uh, in the green boxes, um, if, if people are familiar with um, like how got symbol resolution works on for ELF, you know, it was pretty similar in Mako, but you have like the underscore underscore symbol underscore symbol stub. And so these are where all the like uh, imported functions uh, sim stubs are. So there'll be like a call to like access or stat um, or any other sort of function that you, you want to call that's not in your program. And those will always call to some uh, pointer and that pointer will always be inside the data segment. So the data underscore underscore NL or the LA symbol pointer. And um, it, it'll, it'll, it'll point to a value in those sections. And um, those sections have bytes that are like empty but when you actually go to go call that function, um, the same way in ELF, how the got and the PLT have like a, um, a stub function that actually resolves the pointer when you actually need it, um, the pointer in the data segment will actually jump back to the text stub helper. Um, the stub helper will then call out to DYLD, which is like um, uh, in, in iOS, it's like a daemon that's used to kind of like the zygote for for iOS, um, and it will um, uh, try to um, resolve uh, different symbols, um, and it, it, it does more than that. But um, um, so DYLD will then come back and actually write the pointers back into the data segment. And so the next time you actually go and call things from the symbol stub, you don't actually have to go all the way through back to the um, uh, the text stub helper. It'll just already be in data. That's just quickly how that works. Um, um, this is, um, I think in the previous slide, I talked about uh, the linked edit segment. And so the linked edit segment is super important, um, but it's not totally um, um, like easy to read. Like it's a kind of a, um, you, you couldn't just parse the Mako format to understand what's in the linked edit. Um, but I'll explain a little bit how you can parse it. Um, it, comp it, com it has exports, imports, relocations, and uh, like binding information for symbols. Um, this, this is like super important if you're trying to like figure out like function entry points in the function um, or like figure out what the code is actually importing in. So that's great. Uh, the first thing you want to do when you're looking at an application is like knowing what it's calling and what uh, the en entry points are so you can kind of try to understand like the inputs and outputs of the program. Um, the one thing you want to know here is the LC code signature. So again, these are all load commands. So as I talked about earlier before, load commands are like the way that um, 
the Mako is mapped out. And so most of the load commands here don't actually map a piece of memory into code from the, um, the kernel, or, or, or the kernel doesn't use that to map um, code into the, into the process. This is just like the metadata that I was describing before. And so um, there's, besides the LC code signature, there's also the LC data in code and LC function starts. And these are really, really important. Um, if you're ever writing a disassembler or if anyone's written a disassembler themselves, um, if anyone's written like a recursive descent disassembler, uh, you would know how important LC data in code is. Uh, basically just real re uh, recap, uh, there's a, a huge problem with recursive descent where um, say that, um, so quickly aside, recursive descent is basically a technique where um, you start at a certain function, you start disassembling uh, bytes, and then once you get to like a jump instruction, uh, you have the jump taken and you have the jump not taken. And so you basically split um, your program into two different paths and you assume that uh, the, 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 call, the, the jump will be code. And then you also assume that the bytes after the jump will also be code. In some cases, uh, there, might not be a, um, there might not be code after the jump or sorry, uh, uh, on the bytes after the jump, there might be data instead. And if there's just data, it'll just be garbage instructions and it will just lead you to off to nothing. And so um, if you're writing a disassembler, it's actually really, really useful to know where data is inside the own co in, inside code. And sometimes data is just like embedded for in, in, in the, in the text section for like, if, if it's not going to be modified at all, um, you just stick it in there and instead of having another section, they just stick it in the text. It's kind of weird, but it, it happens a lot. And so this is basically a, an array of where in the code there's data. And so you can skip over that data in the code. It's an amazing way if you're trying to write a disassembler um, for Mako. Um, the other um, thing that um, it, it's, it's, it's a great little command. Um, uh, my, uh, it, it's called the LC function starts. And um, again, if you're writing a disassembler, this is amazing because it tells you uh, uh, the address of functions within the Mako. And this is super awesome if you're trying to write a disassembler again, um, just because um, you don't have to uh, uh, like find heuristics of like, oh, this is the byte, this is, this is a function prolog. Like, oh, let me start disassembling from here. Like this basically tells you exactly where to start disassembling. It's really, really uh, useful. Um, and um, yeah, so I mean, you know, you can also use the export uh, symbol um, symbols to know where functions are, but this is a really good uh, place to start if uh, you're trying to just like figure out like, okay, where should I start disassembling? Um, a lot of disassemblers already use this, but um, uh, to try like enumerate like different functions, so like an IDA, if you're using IDA or something, on the left-hand side, all the functions will probably be populated. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing they use LC function starts. So I hope they do. Um, but yeah, that's kind of some inf important information in the linked edit. Um, and now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some kind of weirdities in Mako. Um, uh, so if you kind of look at this uh, picture right here, you can see the LC segment, uh, and this is for the text segment. And it says on the file that it begins at zero bytes and it goes to OX, you know, OX uh, 18,000 hex. Right? Um, and in the file, if you look at the section, right, uh, the section starts at like 5,208 hex. Um, and you can see that there's like a bunch of bytes missing. It's like 21,000 bytes. And so this is just a quick document from like the Apple Docs. And it would seem, right, it, it would look like the, uh, the, the section would start uh, the first byte of the segment. Right, so like right here, there's a little diagram. Right, it's like seg uh, segment command one. It starts at section one, right, uh, which is kind of weird, right? Um, you, you would assume that it starts from the beginning. And you know, if you if we went back um, like to this slide, you can see that for the data, um, the uh, the the beginning of the data segment starts at like OX eighteen hundred eighteen thousand. And the first section, the data NL symbol pointer, also starts at the same offset, uh, at the file offset. So you know, it, it makes sense that it would start at the beginning. Uh, for the text, apparently, it does not. And um, sorry, yeah, and it, it, it does not. And, and the reason why is because the actual entire Mako header 
is within the tech is within the first bytes of the tech segment. So um, you have the tech segment. The first the first twenty one thousand bytes are the actual Mako for the entire binary, and it's within the tech segment. Um, and, uh, and and so the tech section starts actually after the Mako header. Uh, which it seems a little bit weird, right? Like on ELF, you would have an actual header section and then the segments would start. And the beginning of the segment would be the, also the beginning of the first section. Um, uh, on Mako, that does not happen. Um, and I, I'm not totally exactly sure why this, uh, why this happens. Um, my, my best guess is that the kernel, it knows that it needs to read things from the header anyways. And so for them, it might just be easier to just like take the entire text segment, load it in memory, and then uh, start parsing it and then jump to the first text section when they um, start program execution. Um, if anyone has any like uh, uh, Zenu kernel code like sources to like show me like why they've put the header in the text segment, that'd be great. I'm just curious why that happens. I haven't had um, a bandwidth to dig into that, but uh, it's kind of interesting. Um, and I'll explain to you why it's interesting uh, now. And that is because uh, what the App Store does to the Mako. So the, um, the, the App Store does two things to the, the binary when you submit to the App Store. Um, and I'll talk about what happens in the Mako binary uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the file format that actually changes. Um, but uh, they they do two things. They um, they well from a from, from a higher level from, from a higher level they do two things. They encrypt the binary, um, and then they also re-sign the binary. So these are like the two main things that the App Store does. Um, and you can see right here, right. So I kind of uh, blurred out some of these names, but um, you, you can see what I'm doing. I'm using the O tool, which is a uh, uh, available on most um, systems that. Um, you get it pretty easily. Um, and um, you, uh, the, the first binary is a binary that um, is uh, I dumped from in memory uh, from, a, from an app. And, um, uh, and the second one is the same binary, but before um, it went to the app store. And so um, you can see that there is a, uh, a load command called the LC encryption info. And within that, uh, the LC encryption info basically describes the uh, how the binary is encrypted, and um, uh, it has a crypt off, which describes at what uh, offset it starts encrypting the data, and then the size of how much data is actually encrypted. Um, and then they have this crypt ID, and this crypt ID um, on a piece of code that you um, uh, haven't submitted to the App Store will be uh, a, a zero because it's not encrypted. So um, there's um, nothing to encrypt, but um, uh, I mean, it, it's not encrypted, but uh, the, um, and I'm guessing the Xcode tools create a place to have Apple actually do an encryption mm -hmm. because you have the crypt off and the crypt size. Um, but um, when you actually dump something from like an app that you've got from the app store, the crypt ID will be, will be one. Right, and again, remember all this. This is within the structure of the LC encryption info, which is within the Mako header. Right, so just remember this point. Um, the second thing they do is they actually resign the app, and when they resign the app, um, they add a whole bunch of their own kind of uh, stuff to the app, um, and uh, uh, they basically include like their Root root cert, maybe some sort of like intermediate cert as well, but uh, you, but you can see that they pretty much almost like double the, the 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 size, right? So you can see that it's about uh, one hundred and seventy seventy three thousand um, before, and then after the App Store resigns it, it's about three hundred thirty six thousand bytes, and so. Um, they, they, they pretty much double the code signature. And again, this is, and, and changes the, the, the data size of this load command called the LC code signature. And so basically on a Mako header level, there are two different values that get changed when the Mako goes to the app store. One is the crypt ID field, 
and then the second is the just the data size of the LC code signature. And so these are two pretty important parts to understand. Um, and um, uh, this one right here. Um, so yeah, so you can so, so you can see right here. So I, I, I did a little bit of math um, with the values from the previous slides, but um, the the length that it um, is um, of a certain size. The, co the code signatures are the bottom of the entire binary. Um, and you can see right here that um, the, 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 um, the code signature is at the bottom of the binary, which is uh, kind of useful to know um, from the defender's standpoint. So if you wanted to have some sort of way to um, uh, know what the true values are before you submit to the App Store, um, you can um, uh, parse all of the sections of the linked edit all the way up until the code signature. And, um, and then you can uh, ignore the, the code signature. And that will be stable. So the binary that you produce before you submit to the App Store and after you submit to the App Store up until the code signature, uh, they will not change. Uh, they will not do anything different, but the code signature will be completely different. Um, the the last point is just the fair play DRM, and it's I'm not going to go into the nitty gritties, but there's definitely a bunch of information. I think Jonathan Levine has a really good post about code signature, code signing that you can read him about. Um, but it's just how Apple encrypts their code, um, and here's just a really quick way on how you can actually dump an app from the um, from, from a live device. So I'm using like the Electra jailbreak. Um, here's, um, you can come back and refer to this later, but um, it just, basically you just figure out where the text segment is um, and then you just dump it out to the file. Um, and uh, that's pretty much how you get an encrypt, unencrypted um, binary from an app store you've got from apps, um, um, on your device that's jailbroken. There's a bunch of tools that you can use to do this as well, but I just kind of described how to do it um, in a ghetto style. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, it's Mako is pretty complex, uh, but it has a bunch of really cool information. Um, the App Store changes the Mako a little bit, and um, um, you can easily dump the app, um, and you can also use it to um, um, try to verify your app. Um, before and after you release the App Store. Um, and yep, that's, that's it. Are there any questions or anything? Um, I, I can't actually see the... Uh, like stream. I mean, I, I can I can see the link, but I don't see the comments. Alrighty. Hey, this is Sam. Uh, let's see if we've got any comments. No questions in via um, via YouTube. Okay. Cool. And let's see if there's anything via Twitter. I don't think so. Let me get double check just to make sure. Um, nope, it looks like we're good to go. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. cool. If you guys have any questions, definitely feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. Um, and uh, my, my name is uh, at Mendezler. Um, and yep, cool. Thank you. <laughs>